you need more, just let me know and I'll. So welcome, everyone. I'm uh, Tim Longman. I'm the director of the Institute on Culture, Religion, and World Affairs. Uh, and I am very happy to uh, welcome you for this valedictory address by Luchang Chahabi. Um, I think uh, everybody here knows you at some level. You seem to be quite, oh, quite, be quite popular. Um, <laughs> Uh, as, as students and faculties and friends and other things, uh, uh, we're welcome. Um, I uh, taught across the hall from Hu Chang last semester, uh, and I saw how the students would, at every break from the class, would gather around him to get little nuggets of wisdom, and so uh, I got a sense of just how well-loved he is. Uh, Hu Chang uh, got a diploma from uh, Sciences Po in Paris, uh, MA and PhD from Yale, and he's held academic positions at Harvard, St. Anthony's College of Oxford, UCLA, the University of St. Andrews, uh, and the Universidad uh, Argentina de la Empresa. Uh, he's been at BU since 1998, so a couple of years. Um, he has published two uh, single-authored books, Iranian Politics and Religious Modernism, Liberation Movement of Iran under the Shah and Khomeini, and Distant Relations, Iran and Lebanon in the Last 500 Years. Uh, and he's also co-edited a number of books, which I, I won't list all of them since you're not here to hear me talk. Uh, he teaches a wide range of courses uh, in international law, Middle Eastern politics, uh, and cultural history, on Shiism, um, and uh, is, uh, as I've said, somebody who uh, is, uh, I think, widely loved and will be much missed as, have you taught your last class yet? Yes, or you have? All right, well, uh, let's uh, join uh, Hu Cheng and Hu Cheng. So, the floor is yours. I will take this off. So uh, thank you all for coming, especially to my students, who I would have thought had had enough by, of me by now. But uh, I'm very grateful for to all of you who have uh, come. I would also like to thank uh, Timothy Longman uh, for this kind introduction and Cura for having organized this event. Uh, I'm deeply touched. Uh, all the more so since uh, I remember how my late father was unceremoniously retired from Tehran University after the revolution in 1979 and six months later deprived of his pension, a uh, fate that many musicians uh, also faced. I chose my topic for uh, a number of reasons. Religion, mass media, and charismatic authority, Iranian music in the revolutionary decade. The R in Cura stands for religion. And over the last decade, every scholar of contemporary Iran has had to address the issue of uh, religion and society. Moreover, this being my swan song, I thought it would be fitting to talk about music. And finally, my other father, my doctor father, my doctoral father, as we say in German, Juan Linz, used to say that one can never quote Max Weber enough. <laughs> and uh, it was Max Weber who defined uh, charismatic authority. The uh, millions of people who greeted the Ayatollah Khomeini uh, at the airport in Tehran in early 1979 and then attended his speeches and rallies revived interest in the very concept of charismatic authority. As if he had foreseen the uh, Khomeini phenomenon, Max Weber defined the charismatic leader as the, quote, natural leader in times of psychic, physical, economic, ethical, religious, and political distress who, quote again, seizes the task at hand that is adequate to him and demands obedience. He goes on to say that, and this is very important for my paper, genuine charismatic domination knows of no abstract legal codes, adding, uh, and then he adds, that it's the attitude, uh, that the attitude of the leader is revolutionary and transvalues everything. It makes a sovereign break with all traditional and rational norms. A sovereign break with all traditional and rational norms. Music emerged as a major issue in Iranian politics after the Islamic Revolution of 1979. The constitution of the Islamic Republic proclaimed that, quote, all civil, penal, financial, economic, administrative, cultural, military, political, and other laws and regulations must be based on Islamic criteria. And that radio and television, this is where the media come in, radio and television must serve the diffusion of Islamic culture. 
elucidating these criteria for radio and television therefore became an urgent task because the broadcast media remained a state monopoly after the revolution. Given that the 12 Shiite religious establishment lacks a centralized office for the formulation of doctrine analogous to the uh, Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith in the Catholic Church, disagreement about details of doctrine is legitimate amongst, among the most learned of the ulama who alone are empowered to interpret and develop doctrine. As long as the ulama held no political power, clerical disagreements were of no import to state policy. But once an Islamic republic with clerical oversight over the state apparatus was established in 1979, they became problematic because guidelines for radio and television and the rest of society were needed to comply with the constitution. The problem was establishing these guidelines for there is no consensus on them. Let me quote from a short article by Yusuf Islam, the artist known as Cat Stevens, before his conversion to Islam. He's, he said, one of the things which is, it is necessary to clarify is the legal position of music in connection with the teachings of Islam. But he is cautious. Quote again, it appears that song and singing are lawful, but they become unlawful, abominable, or laudable according to time, circumstance, place, style, content, and motive. While he avers that, quote, everything is clear in Islam, and that anyway, Muslim can, Muslims cannot be expected to live such a pristine and puritanical life that makes us impossible to live with, he concludes that, quote, a lot more thought has to, be, has to go into this, area, into this area and a lot more development because there are songs and singing in Islam, there is melody as well as drums, but it, is hard, it has to be within limits. It's precisely these limits that the apparatus of the Islamic Republic had to define. Twelve Shiite doctrine declared most, if not all, types of music as forbidden. The ulama disagree on, uh, on this issue. Uh, the most important uh, issue is the voice, especially the woman's voice. Now, this, of course, did not prevent Iranians from preserving and developing a rich musical heritage after Twelver Shiism became uh, Iran's official religion 500 years ago. Uh, very briefly put, there are three reasons for this. First of all, not all Iranians were Muslims. And in fact, Jews played a major role in the preservation of uh, Iranian music over the centuries. In fact, in li within living memory, uh, music shops, shops selling instruments, for instance, were located in the Jewish neighborhood of Tehran. Second, not all Muslims were devoutly observant. And third, not all devoutly observant Muslims adhered to the legalistic, Sharia-minded Islam of the clergy. Other traditions within Islam, for instance, Sufism, valorized music and included in their rituals. One thinks of the Sema of the Mevlevi dervishes in, uh, in Turkey, for instance. In fact, the first public concert in Iran was organized shortly after the Constitutional Revolution in 1906 by a Sufi order. Moreover, debates about the permissibility of music did not take place, take place in a vacuum, but in a society that was in revolutionary turmoil and in which religious commitment was neither uniform nor universal. Faced with the reality of governing a state, Khomeini's own views evolved deepening doctrinal disagreements among the clergy. I will present my talk in three parts. I mean, I'm French educated, so that's what one does. <laughs> three parts. Uh, the first part will be about the problematic of music and revolution. Uh, the second part about uh, music in the Islamic Republic. And the third one, Khomeini's fatwas, which uh, changed the um, uh, doctrine. The revolutionaries of 1978 and 1979, whether Islamist or leftist, were united in their opposition to the Shah's cultural policies, which, according to them, favored vulgar, degenerate, and West-struck music and all forms of artistic expression at the expense of authentic ones, all with the aim of corrupting the young and distracting them from the real issues facing the country, despotism, imperialism, injustice, corruption, 
so as to facilitate Iran's exploitation by the West. Iran's revolutionaries were not unique in their suspicion of music, uh, for ever since Plato, utopian political projects have had an uneasy relationship with music, as discussed by Karl Popper in his The Open Society and His Enemies. Let me give you a few examples. Lenin, himself a music lover who knew nothing greater than the appassionata, told a group of friends that he could not listen to music too often, as it affects the nerves, makes you want to say kind, silly things, to stroke the heads of the people who, living in a terrible hell, can create such beauty. Lenin concluded that, nowadays, you mustn't stroke anyone's head. You'd get your hand bitten off. You've got to hit them over the heads without mercy, although ideally, we're against the use of force. <laughs> Fidel Castro, my colleague Paul Hare informed me, uh, banned the Beatles in the early 1960s as decadent, commercial, and un-Cuban. Even a prominent uh, Cuban pro-revolutionary singer, such as Silvio Rodriguez, lost his job on state TV for advocating the, mu the music of the Beatles. Perhaps this utopian suspicion of music is due to music being the most abstract of arts. The true music lover enjoys it for its own sake in a manner that brings to mind the tenets of arts for art's sake. As Oscar Wilde, one of the greatest theorists of the sensibility of art for art's sake, put it in a programmatic statement, quote, all art is quite useless. <laughs> it is precisely the useless character of pure music, in fact that it does not serve an ulterior purpose beyond providing listening pleasure that makes it suspicious in the eyes of many revolutionaries and killjoy Puritans, categories that sometimes overlap. <laughs> it is probably not a coincidence that the few types of music that more liberal clerics consider permissible are useful genres, such as war songs, lullabies, caravan songs, etc. Indulgence in a useless activity distracts from useful pursuits and causes, uh, pursuits and causes that, quote, really matter. This can be seen in the thought of Ali Shariati, the highly influential lay modernist Islamic ideologue of the 1970s, who argued that if properly understood, 12 Shiism was just as revolutionary and progressive as Marxism. On September 12, 1972, he gave a long lecture in which he devoted one section to the clerical prohibition of music. Shariati claimed that the Quran nowhere prohibits music, which is actually true. Uh, he goes on to say that like any other art, music either numbs or mobilizes. It is either positive or negative, epic or lyrical. It is either, quote, a responsible art in the service of society or an irresponsible art, parenthesis, art for art's sake, an art that is in the service of private feelings, entertainment, sexuality, and pleasure. Horror of horrors. <laughs> the former is exemplified by Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, which Shariati claims brought tears to the cheek of the Iron Chancellor Bismarck. Examples of the latter are music played in cabarets and dance halls, as well as the music of the Beatles, uh, Johnny Hallyday, the unforgotten French rock star, and Elvis Presley not to mention the music one heard in films, in music halls, on radio, television, and at parties. It was this music, according to Shariati, that Shiite jurisprudence forbade. Not only Shiite jurisprudence, he added, but also committed intellectuals and all groups who possess an ideology and carry the heavy burden of jihad and the awakening of the masses on their shoulders. Hmm? Stalin would have agreed. Uh, which is, he concludes, why Western colonialists promoted music. They glorify jazz to turn blacks, who should be awakened fighters, into dancing entertainers. And in Germany, they promote Elvis Presley as an idol of Germany's youth, with the aim of breaking the epic spirit of Germans so that they would forget the he their heroes and resign themselves to their defeat. Now, for Muslim Puritans, what matters is faith, devotion, and abstinence from sin. Music constitutes, to borrow a term from Catholic theology, quote, 
an occasion of sin. Uh, occasion of sin meaning a, uh, an object, people, or situations that incite or entice one to sin. More specifically, sex and alcohol. This association, of course, is not unknown in the West, where we've had the old triad, uh, one women and wine, women, and song, uh, Wein, Weib, und Gesang, uh, falsely attributed to Martin Luther, and more recently, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. For religious revolutionaries in Iran, the two sets of antipathies combined. Music was suspicious not only because it was sinful or conducive to sin, but also because it distracted from really important issues. But this confluence is not unique, and I want to give a few examples. When Friar Girolamo Savonarola briefly ruled Renaissance Florence and dedicated himself to fighting clerical corruption, the despotic rule of the Medici, and the exploitation of the poor, his followers also lit a bonfire in which they burned cosmetics, art, books, fine dresses, playing cards, musical instruments, and even manuscripts of secular songs, an action that has since been called Bonfire of Vanities. In the same vein, when Usman Danfodio led a jihad early in the 19th century in Central Africa, almost all sorts of musical instruments and activities were banned in the name of reforming the pre-Islamic Moris of uh, those nominally Muslim states that had been conquered by his jihad. In the Arabian Peninsula, the Wahhabi strongly opposed music, so much so that when uh, Ottoman Egyptian forces conquered the first Saudi state, the torture they meted out to Abdul Wahhab's grandson before he was executed included making him listen to music. Uh, which reminds one, of course, of uh, the fate of Man Manuel Noriega in uh, Panama when uh, the United States uh, blasted Van Halen cassette tapes at a very uh, high level uh, at his uh, place, place of refuge, the embassy of the uh, Holy See. Eventually, he surrendered. <laughs> um, in the early 20th century, when the militant Ikhwan allied with Al Saud to create the third Saudi state, today Saudi Arabia, King Abdulaziz allowed them to destroy his prized gramophone in order to consolidate their allegiance to him. The task of bringing musical practices in line with Islam, however, presented the revolutionary regime in Iran with a major dilemma. The political project of the Islamists was above all cultural, yet music is an inseparable part of any society's culture. Conflict over music broke out soon after the fall of the monarchy in February 1979. Very early on, frivolous music, pop music, was banned from the broadcast media. This did not satisfy the clerics, however, and a tug of war broke out over the proper place, if any, of music in uh, public life, and especially on radio and television. So radio and television became the locus of the policy dispute. A complicated factor is that doctrine only addresses is an issue in general terms. It says wine is forbidden. But it does not specify whether a particular instance falls under that rule. The red liquid in this glass is forbidden is wine or not. That determination, whether a particular instance is part of a general rule, is left to the observant believer. This left the responsible those responsible for programming on radio and television in a quandary because they now had to define for the listener what was legal and what was not legal. Finally, in the summer of 1979, Khomeini issued clear, uh, clear orders. And this is uh, how it happened, my part two. In 1972, a radio station called Radio Dario, a C, uh, Radio C, had been set up on the shores of the Caspian Sea, broadcast only in the summer months with traffic reports, local information, music, pop music, and was very popular with young listeners. In the spring of 1979, with the summer holidays in sight, a delegation of citizens from that part of the world, of Iran, went to Qom, where uh, Khomeini was residing, to request that Radio Dario resume its broadcasting because they wanted their hotels filled. Two younger clerics who were known in the area were dispatched to get Radio Dario, Radio again. 
One of them is actually quite known to those of you who follow Iranian events. It's the uh, thinker Yusufi Eshkemeri, uh, from whom I have the story. Uh, these two clerics, when they took control of uh, this radio station, discarded frivolous music, pop music in other words, but not music of a more serious kind, including folk songs, for instance. But the personnel of the radio station were still the old one. Uh, they uh, were unhappy with the conservative direction the country was going, so to assuage their grumbling, uh, the two clerics decided to go directly to Khomeini and ask him for his advice. You tell us what we should do. So on July 21st, 1979, Khomeini met with this delegation in Qom, and he began asserting that non-divine political regimes such as the overthrown monarchy attempted to corrupt uh, the youth uh, using radio, television, and cinema with the aim of distracting them from the vital problems of the day. Another way this, uh, he did this was, uh, another way they, these ungodly regimes did this, he said, was to encourage the mingling of young people, of men and women, in the sea. Not because they wanted people to enjoy themselves, but because they wanted to corrupt them. When two people have spent months together at the, on the sea sh seashore, they do not ask what needs to be done when others want to take our oil. Cinemas, radios, and the press were all deviant and misled young people. About music in particular, he added, quote, one of the things that intoxicate young people's minds is music. When a person has listened for a while to music, their brain becomes different from that of a serious person. It expels one from reality and turns one's attention to different matters. All this was part of a wide-ranging plan to corrupt the youth so that they would not rebel. He admits that while it is natural to like music, listening to it for many hours has the same effect as drugs. And then he instructs his listeners, if you want your country to be a correct country, a free country, an independent country, take matters seriously from now on. Make radio and television instructive. Eliminate music. Don't fear being called old fashioned. There's no excuse. He ended by pointing out that unlike newspapers and journals, which are read by relatively few people, radio and television are accessible to all, educated un and uneducated. For that reason, they should be used to educate the young. To comply with Khomeini's order, the head of uh, the music section of the radio and television is issued a directive in which he advised producers and tone engineers that henceforth only revolutionary anthems, saruts, and marches could be broadcast over the airways. A list of permitted pieces was combined, compiled. TV became a broadcasting uh, pulpit with uh, talking turbaned heads. Uh, dubbed Western programs, which had been a, a serials, which had been a staple of pre-revolutionary TV, were banned. Uh, but after a while, the band was relaxed for a while. Uh, apparently, one of the few American programs that was allowed in the early years of the revolution was Little House on the Prairie, uh, because the, clericals, uh, the clerics appreciated the family values of the serial. <laughs> Finally, on March 7th, Khomeini issued, uh, March 7th, 1980, Khomeini issued a concise and unambiguous fatwa in answer to the question, what kind of music is allowed in Islam? The answer of the fatwa is, music is absolutely forbidden. While Khomeini adhered to establish 12 Shia doctrine when asked about music in general, he had more nuanced views in private. When his disciple Ayatollah Mur uh, Murtaza Mutahari was assassinated in May 1979, a song was composed in his memory which actually moved him. Similarly, when a cassette recording of a piece by the symphonic composer Mortaza Hannane was played for him, he found nothing wrong with either. And for those of you who are too young to remember, this is an audio cassette. <laughs> Music never completely disappeared from the airwaves, for implementing the ban on music would have been very difficult in practice. There were a number of reasons for this. First of all, during the mass demonstrations preceding Khomeini's return, demonstrators had sung revolutionary anthems, and uh, 
leftists had participated uh, in them. They had uh, sung uh, Persian translations of revolutionary Latin American or Palestinian songs, and my friend Puya um, uh, Oli Maram is uh, here, who is a specialist on this issue. Uh, so when leftists started singing, the Islamists had no choice but to start singing too. And uh, eventually, of course, they won. Uh, the leftists were marginalized. And I always thought that uh, Tom Lehrer's take on revolutionary music in the Spanish Civil War is very opposite here, where he writes, though he, though he may have won all the battles, we had all the good songs. <laughs> uh, this is from Tom Lehrer's song, uh, The Folk Song Army. Some of you may remember. A certain type of music was thus part and parcel of the incoming regime's propaganda apparatus. These were the revolutionary anthems. The outbreak of the Iran-Iraq war in September 1980 had two, similarly, uh, two seemingly contradictory effects. On the one hand, it provided an added impetus to the prohibition of joyful music, uh, the prohibition and even enjoyment of which was now deemed by the regime to be an insult to the fighters on the front and to the memory of the fallen. But it also contributed to the survival of music in, pu in the public sphere because these revolutionary anthems were seen to be effective mobilizational devices both at and behind the front lines. Um, A government supervised by clerics was now sponsoring music in the public sphere with these revolutionary anthems, much to the annoyance of more traditional clerics who opposed clerical government in the first place, arguing that governmental responsibility sullied the clergy. Finally, while music programs were eliminated from the radio, television could not operate without music. For documentaries, newsreels, the ever-popular Czech cartoons, and other educational programs could not be broadcast without some form of musical soundtrack. Most music used for these purposes was sedate Western classical music. The result of the above was that while the government was in theory hostile to music, music did not totally disappear from public life. Given Khomeini's uh, unambiguous fatwa against music, however, the music that was still permitted in public had to be renamed. It was now called sorud, namely anthem, as opposed to musiri, which is the old Persian word for music. Since the regime needed a, at least a few musicians to write, orchestrate, and perform its revolutionary anthems, the music division of the Administration of Fine Arts founded in 1947 was renamed Administration of Revolutionary Anthems in the early 1980s to supervise the country's musical life. Among the guidelines it produced was a list of poems that singers were not allowed to sing and the prohibition of the 6 8 beat. I find this uh, fascinating, the 6 8 beat uh, Is, a, uh, is known as the mother's milk of uh, Iranian music. And uh, it is considered to be moratras, uh, which means dance inducing. I mean, you hear this rhythm and Iranian arms rise and, you know. <laughs> uh, so uh, just uh, for uh, you not to think that this is unique to Iran, uh, let me point out that the Terpsichorean potential of the 6 8 beat was also recognized in 18th century Europe when the Catholic Church thought of banning the Fandango, which is also a 6 8 beat. Uh, but then somebody uh, had the idea, uh, one of the padres uh, had the idea that one cannot ban something one doesn't know. So they invited two musicians to perform the fandango, and everybody loved it and started dancing. <laughs> uh, so uh, at that point, uh, they decided not to ban it. Uh, and uh, this uh, was, became such a cause celebre that a number of uh, Spanish comedies were written about it. And in the 19th century, uh, a ballet was produced in Paris by the name of Le Procès du Fandango, the trial of the Fandango. 
So six eight speed is dubious everywhere in the world. But back to revolutionary rock. The performance of the limited repertoire of permitted music created its own problem for the authorities. The state radio and television organization having sacked most musicians in its employment, only two orchestras were left to record revolutionary anthems. Playing instruments being forbidden, however, remunerating the few remaining musicians who were on the state's payroll became in theory impossible. In fact, the very act of signing a document mentioning the word music was considered uh, a sin. And since owning a musical instrument became a liability and could be used as evidence against the owner, those musicians who played the narrow range of approved music needed special permits, as if they were handling weapons. Finally, trade in muse instruments being forbidden, it became difficult to replace or even to repair instruments. Nonetheless, a few concerts uh, took place uh, here and there. Um, audio cassette tapes, the very medium uh, through which Khomeini had mobilized the masses during the revolution, replaced the radio as a major source of music. They were sold on street corners and so on. And new tapes of pop musicians who had fled to Los Angeles after the revolution were smuggled into the country, copied and sold on the sidewalks by uh, flying vendors. The persistence of music in public life, even on radio and television, could not fail to arouse the anger of the most culturally conservative clerics. In March 1980, Ayatollah Hassan Tabatabai Romi in Mashhad, the northeast of the country, a conservative cleric who was against the idea of an Islamic Republic to begin with, uh, complained that demonstrators had entered the shrine of the eighth Imam, the holiest shrine in Iran, uh, to sing anthems in a, long, in a loud voice, which to him was an unprecedented outrage. He was put under house arrest. Uh, and he died in house arrest uh, in 2007. This is what I call, or what Weber called, a sovereign break with traditional norms. The objections of the culturally more conservative wing of the ruling clergy was more important. Those who oppose you, you can put them under house arrest. But those who are within the system, when they object, you have a problem. The incessant grumbling of conservatives on the one hand and the complaints of more secular citizens who wanted entertaining programs on television put the leadership of state radio television in a bind. From 1981 to 1993, state radio and television was headed by Mohammad Hashemi, the younger brother of Ali Akbar Rafsanjani, the uh, leading, one of the leading figures in the regime who became president in 1989. Now, the younger Hashemi, the head of radio and television, had spent some time as a student in California and was somewhat more open-minded. They say he even had an American girlfriend, to which he responded that he had given her a temporary marriage. <laughs> in uh, 1982, uh, he admitted that his organization faced an acute lack of experts and was incapable of producing a broad range of programs. In response to criticisms that the programs were not entertaining, he said that there were very few committed artists who could produce Islamic programming, adding that Islamic values were another reason the production of entertaining programs was limited. He also said that the status of music under the Sharia had not been clarified, still not. Wherefore, it is very difficult for us to know the borderline between joyful music, which is forbidden, and non-joyful music. This intervention did not settle the issue and complaints from both sides continued. One interesting polemic against music was a 1987 book called Music in History and in the Quran, uh, which, uh, in which the author uh, very approvingly mentions Mr. Savonarola, who had ordered all musical instruments to be burned in Florence. And uh, he also says that the first Muslim ruler to propagate music was the Caliph Yazid, the ultimate villain of uh, Iranian history, whom Shiites revile for having ordered the killing of Imam uh, Hussein. Um, in another uh, anti-music uh, polemic, polemic, a member of the Islamic Republic's Air Force added physiological arguments. He said, because of its countless vibrations, Music directly affects the nerves. When music is joyous or sad, the equilibrium between sympathetic and parasympathetic 
nerves is broken, which harms digestion, <laughs> the absorption and uh, the absorption of liquids, uh, heartbeat, and blood pressure, and that and thus readies the body for sometimes incurable diseases. The, uh, the author then adds that listening to joyful music begets mania. Listening to sad music leads to weakness, insomnia, and pessimism, while alternating joyful and sad music results in cyclosemia. <laughs> what is interesting about such uh, polemics is that they try to show the congruence of science and religion. Only where previous modernists in the 1960s had tried to show that religion agrees with science, these authors attempted to show that science agrees with religion. This I find an interesting shift, but I'm not equipped to analyze it. I leave that to, the sc to scholars of religion. In October 1987, an article in the conservative newspaper Resolat complained that the governments had not issued clear regulations about music. I mean, an issue that hadn't been settled in 1,000 years couldn't be settled in seven years. And invited the authorities to define the religious criteria that distinguished permissible from forbidden music. It added, in an Islamic society, one cannot allow people to play and sing what they want and permit any company to sell to the public any tape it wants. The government's silence on this matter signals approval. A music store, as music stores grow like mushrooms on every street corner selling all sorts of music, the sellers are emboldened seeing that they are being left alone. And the people conclude that if these tapes were religiously objectionable, the governments would not permit their sale. So in other words, do something. So I now come to the third part, which is uh, Khomeini's fatwas on music. Complaints, in other words, continued. When a member of the Clerical Oversight Committee of Radio Television objected to foreign unveiled women being shown on Iranian television, not all the women in A House on the Prairie are always covered, he and uh, Mohammad Hashami, uh, the head of radio television, took the matter to Khomeini and asked his juridical opinion on the following issues. One, broadcasting films in which women are not totally covered. Two, Broadcasting sports programs in which men are not fully covered. Three, watching such programs. And then a clerical member of the advisory board added a question on whether it was proper for television to spend money on the production of TV serials and to broadcast music. This is what Khomeini replies. Watching these kinds of plays and films is religiously unobjectionable. Many of them are educational, and broadcasting them is unobjectionable. The same holds for sports coverage. Likewise, the songs are mostly unobjectionable. There are some rare exceptions, and more caution is in order. And he adds, but viewers must not watch these programs out of lust. In other words, it's for the viewer to decide whether this is permissible or not. This was followed up in early 1988 by the head of the Fars, Police, Fars Province Office of the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance, who submitted nine questions regarding music to Khomeini, asking him to remove uncertainties. Khomeini's nine fatwas established the following. One, while joyful music remains forbidden, the determination of what music is joyful is based on customary criteria, meaning that it's for the listener to decide whether it's joyful or not. Two, it is permissible to teach permissible music. Three, instrumental music is permitted. Four, instruments used for forbidden music must be avoided, but it is permissible to use dual purpose instruments. <laughs> Five, music can be performed in front of a live audience. Six, a man can sing solo in front of an audience, meaning a woman cannot. In the collective, if the collective singing of women induces corruption, it must be avoided. In other words, a woman cannot sing solo. Women can sing in a choir, unless. Men and women can perform together, provi provided it does not induce corruption. Nine, for classical Western music, the same rules apply. Khomeini's rules were celebrated by Rafsanjani, who was still a uh, Speaker of Parliament then, uh, as a victory of pure and progressive Islam against traditional dogmatism. 
But the dogmatic traditionalists did not disarm. Grand Ayatollah Mohammad Reza Golpaigani issued a ruling confirming that music was forbidden, even if broadcast from the radio, from the Islamic Republic's media, and even on tapes that had received a permit from the Ministry of Islamic Guidance. In other words, a direct criticism of the government. Only a few months later, a scholar from Rome uh, challenged the first ruling by quoting uh, a saying of Imam Jafar Sadiq, one of the founders of Shiite uh, jurisprudence, which he interpreted as so as to mean that trade in instruments was forbidden, whatever they use. In his response, uh, uh, Khomeini lashed out on the conservative ulama. He says, and this is, I think, the crux of the matter. Before getting to your questions, I have to ex express my regret over your interpretation of divine laws. According to your views, bringing unused lands under cultivation would mean that today, too, Shiites can clear forests, destroy the environment, and endanger the lives of millions of people without anybody being able to stop them. Homes and mosques whose sites are needed for planning purposes to solve traffic problems and save the lives of thousands of people could not be torn down. According to your interpretation of divine laws, modern civilization would have to disappear completely and people would have to become cave dwellers. Khomeini then refutes uh, Ghadiri's views on uh, musical instruments and the adds that there are many aspects to this question which, however, he has neither the time nor the right mood to answer. <laughs> uh, and he gives uh, Ghadiri the, fi uh, the fatherly advice to consider only God and not allowed, himself, not allowed to himself to be influenced by stupid bigots and illiterate ahunds. Ahund is a derogatory term in Iran for clerics. Okay. Now, Khomeini's answer, I think, is interesting for a number of reasons. First, it illustrates his disdain for the traditional ulama, uh, whom he calls by the derogatory term, ahund. Second, he does not provide dictatorial reasoning. Khomeini had broken with centuries of jurisprudence before, for instance, when he issued a fatwa to the effect that the sturgeon and therefore caviar were halal. But on that occasion, he had based his ruling on a careful study carried out by a commission of ulema and zoologists that had verified that the sturgeon, contrary to past assumptions, did indeed have scales, as permissible fish must have in 12 Shiism. This time, however, he dispensed with giving detailed arguments to justify his fatwas. His repost was in line with charismatic authority, which Max Weber summed up, quoting the words of Jesus Christ as, it has been written, but I say unto you. This is exactly what Khomeini is doing. Third, he acknowledges the weight of changed circumstances. This flexibility is also manifest in his response to the objection that some of the music broadcast on radio television now had already been broadcast under the Shah. He dismisses this as saying that um, we consider music forbidden if it's broadcast by Radio Hejaz, by which he means Saudi Arabian radio television. If the music was broadcast under the Shah, then it would have been forbidden. But if it's broadcast today, it's all right. Khomeini's rulings had an immediate impact. Uh, in August 1988, the war with Iraq ended, and it became difficult to maintain the atmosphere of mobilization and mourning that had accompanied the state's anti-Thalian policies. Uh, many music now flooded public spaces. Uh, even Islamic bookstores uh, provided background music. And uh, apparently, uh, uh, TV sets were soon sold out uh, because the people who had been cautious now knew that music is all right and therefore went and bought TV sets. Um, Khomeini's rulings also liberalized the artistic atmosphere uh, in Iran. Uh, and uh, this was uh, under the supervision of a relatively liberal minister of culture, uh, Mohammad Khatami, who was then con uh, forced by the conservatives to resign in 1992, but was elected president in 1997. Uh, when uh, Ayatollah Khamenei uh, became a supreme leader of Iran after Khomeini's death in 1989, uh, the situation changed uh, a little bit. 
uh, because his um, religious credentials were a bit dubious, and so he had to be more careful in challenging uh, tradition. Uh, and uh, so the conservatives took uh, uh, courage again and started grumbling. This is what conservatives in Iran do. They grumble uh, in their sermons. Um, and so since Khomeini had legalized music, the only way they could uh, complain was to argue about the type of music that Khomeini had legalized. In the spring of 1991, uh, Mohammad Hoshami, still uh, head of radio television, responded to the conservative criticism and he revealed that he had visited Khomeini to talk about music. And uh, that some had objected that Imam Khomeini might not watch television and therefore might not be aware of the kind of awful programs you're producing. Some, he said, were even so impertinent as to suggest that since the Imam was old, music did not affect him, whereas a younger person might be aroused. <laughs> Hashemi's final point was, the Imam gave us, viewers and listeners, clear instructions. From our point of view, our programs are not contrary to the Sharia. But if there's anyone who is tempted to sin because of them, their duty is not to watch. We cannot limit our programming because, of a, small, because a small minority objects. The conservatives argued that uh, for a, uh, uh, sorry, Another uh, conservative uh, uh, leader uh, argued that uh, Iranian music was a virus that led the nation to corruption. And this is not the kind of music that the imam had had in mind when he legalized it. So um, the, uh, the final uh, point uh, comes when a conservative uh, uh, cleric, one of Ayatollah Golpaigani's followers, writes this thick volume. You can see it here, over 600 pages, beautifully bound in leather and gold, so as to signal authoritativeness. Uh, publishes a book arguing that music is forbidden. Now, this is a man who was so conservative that he had previously written a book in which he had argued that Iranians should not celebrate Nowruz, uh, the classical, uh, the Iranian uh, New Year. He had also written a book in defense of veiling. So uh, this 630-page tome called A Consideration of Music Through Scripture and Sunnah was published in the summer of 1993. Probably in order to give the impression of compliance with official state policy, the author quotes Khomeini at length earlier on in the book. But what he quotes is the 1979 uh, uh, speech, not his later fatwas, which he completely ignores. And he uh, recounts stories of extensive merrymaking at the courts of Sunni caliphs to prove that in the past music was associated with evil. And then he gives an exhaustive and very repet repetitive account of everything scholars of the past have written about music uh, or attributed to the prophet and to the 12 Shiite uh, imams. The evidence overwhelmingly points to the absolute prohibition of any type of music. Um, and he um, uh, makes the, he wants to argue that even instrumental music is forbidden. And uh, to make his point, he tells a story of the medieval scholar Al-Farabi, known in the Islamic world as the second, Arist the second teacher after Aristotle. Uh, and he says that Al-Farabi had such a command of his instrument that once when playing at the court of a ruler, he first made the audience laugh, then cry, then fall asleep. Uh, and then he quotes, to clinch the argument, he quotes, from arguably one of the most well-known verse in Persian poetry, the Masnavi of Rumi, uh, which begins, listen to the reed, how it tells a tale, complaining of separation, saying, ever since I was parted from the reed bed, my lament has caused men and women to moan. What is the lesson he draws from this? 
that even instrumental music affects your psychological state. And then he concludes that this is exactly what idols do, and hence music is the same as sheriff, polytheism. And you cannot be uh, more clear than that. So uh, since then, uh, there have been um, other books uh, in favor of against, uh, in favor and against uh, music. But given the development of music in Iran, these debates have become uh, quite uh, irrelevant. Now, to conclude, Khomeini's fatwas did not put an end to what Henry George Farmer, the eminent musicologist, has called the, quote, interminable debate of the question whether it was lawful for Muslims to listen to music, unquote. Learned books expounding open-minded views are still being published, but one can also find articles that implicitly criticize Khomeini's later rulings. However, as I said before, the debate has become irrelevant. Even though it still occasionally happens that a local religious authority cancels a concert for which the state institutions have given a permit. There are a number of factors that facilitated the state's volt fass. First, Iranian art music is deeply informed by religious symbolism. As clerical orthodoxy is only one of the several types of religious sensibility among Iranians. And this fact was used with various degrees of sincerity and cynicism by musicians to legitimate their art an art whose roots in elements, in elements of traditional society no one could deny. Second, Islam as a religion and Islamism as an ideology respect two loci of human activity, the family and private enterprise. The first meant that, as in the centuries before the Constitution of 1906, Constitutional Revolution of 1906, and after the Islamic Revolution of 1978, the honing and transmission of musical skills found a safe haven in the privacy of people's homes. The second meant that unlike an ideologically mot motivated state that monopolizes the means of production and commercial activity, the Islamist states had to come to terms with the recording industry and shops that, to quote the above mentioned article, grew like mushrooms on every street corner. The reluctant acceptance of Persian art music by the authorities opened the floodgates to many other types of music, such as hip hop, rock, uh, etc. I would like to draw three lessons from what I've said. First, the Sharia is not stagnant and can evolve. However, since 12 Shiism lacks a living imam to reinterpret doctrine and guide the community, change is slow as a consensus has to emerge among the ulama, which takes time. Second, Iran is not as unique as many Iranians think and not as exceptional as many non-Iranians think. That's why it's always useful to keep a comparative perspective in a case study. Third, in the end, music always triumphs. <laughs> in Florence, I remind you, Savonarola was first hanged and then burned as a heretic in 1498. Music has since then flourished in Italy. In what is now northern Nigeria, European travelers witnessed a lively music scene only a few years after the end of Usman Dan Podio's jihad. In our own time, Saudi Arabia hosted a Justin Lieber concert last year. <laughs> and in Iran, the 21st century has brought about an efflorescence of different styles and genres and a degree of popular appreciation and of engagement with music which is unprecedented in the country's history. Who knows, perhaps one day even puritanical Boston will get a proper opera house <laughs> and a decent resident opera company. Thank you. Will you, will you take some questions? If there are any. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I saw Mary Poppins again, 
But this time it was in Persian. Yes. And it was performed in Tehran. And women were singing solos and dancing. I'm wondering if you can shed some light on this uh, evolution. Well, uh, no, I cannot shed any light, but I'm not astonished uh, because uh, society develops uh, at its own pace and the government has to pick its fights. Uh, my hunch is that given the economic crisis, given the environmental crisis, uh, the government takes it a little bit more easy on cultural issues uh, because um, uh, you cannot make an enemy of everybody. But that's uh, very interesting. Mary Poppins uh, with the, Americ with the uh, original melodies sung in the Persian language. Uh, some of the original are spoken in English. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, uh, this is, yeah, I mean, this is part of the ongoing negotiation between, uh, between artists who, you know, who constantly push the borders, and somebody in the Ministry of Islamic Guidance may have slept, uh, or somebody in the Ministry of Islamic Guidance may have been bribed. Uh, so uh, I don't know what the case is, but uh, I'm not astonished. Yeah. Um, in the modern Islamic world, uh, has there ever been uh, another type of movement to regulate or to define music on an institutional level like what was in Iran? Um, institutional level, I'm not aware of it. Uh, because this would take uh, Saudi Arabia, perhaps. But uh, other than that, uh, may very well be. And if anybody in the audience uh, knows another case, I'd be the grateful Taliban, to learn. The Taliban, right? hmm? the Taliban, yeah. Yeah, the Taliban, obviously. Uh, the Taliban, who in their regulatory zeal went even beyond the Islamic Republic. I mean, when they were first in power, they had a minimum length for men's beards, for instance. So uh, all aspects of uh, life are regulated. Yeah. Um, I mean, as we know, Iran is in a tradition of traditionally society has always been not very conformity to what the public officials say. And, and I think it's also can be uh, explaining how music never died in Iran. Yeah. Never, never, never died. Yeah. It was very I private. I remember this anecdote uh, not long after the revolution in Iran. And um, a former colleague I knew from Shiraz was visiting Boston. And I asked him, oh, how is it living in Iran now with Khomeini and all the Islamists and all the banning of things? He said, oh, Guri, you know we, how we are. We Iranians, you, when the Shah was reigning, we sang in, pr in, in public. And then we went and prayed in at home. And now we do the opposite. <laughs> it's, it's so it's so Iranian. Yeah. I think it applies to the music too. Yeah. Dancing music and yeah. yeah. But one shouldn't generalize too much. I mean, uh, yeah. there are plenty of real Puritans in Iran. There are plenty of people who refuse to have a radio in their house because yeah. they want to be tempted to listen to it. Yeah. These people yeah. exist too. Yeah. And the interesting thing is that. It's among these people that the uh, restrictions are becoming more loose. Yeah. 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 Nicole. Thank you, Professor Shahabi, for your wonderful lecture. But you forgot to mention how the song of Bernadette became the most popular movie in Iran and was played like, like The Little House on the Prairie over and over and over. I and didn't over. forget to mention it because I didn't know that. Now you know, <laughs> Song of Bernadette was like the movie that could be played post-revolution. Okay. Um, and every young Iranian who grew up at that time knows very well about uh, the singer. Okay. So Interesting. Add that to your next uh, draft. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Paul. This, this may be a silly question, but in the debate over mu music among the ulama, with the sort of musical qualities of the call to prayer, how did that fit in? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, that's one of the ways that music actually survived. Because uh, it's not only the call to play prayer, it's also the recitation of the Quran. 
And uh, the tone art, the techniques that must be mastered in order to uh, recite the call to prayer or the Quran are exactly the same techniques that uh, singers have to uh, learn. I mean, let us not forget that the greatest singer the Middle East ever produced, Um Kulthum, uh, in Egypt, uh, was a uh, uh, recited the Quran in her in her in her childhood. Uh, the greatest Iranian singer of the 20th century has recorded the entire Quran. So this was a way that uh, sort of the art uh, of uh, the art and the techniques of singing, which are very very complicated, could be transmitted. Uh, and so there's always a give and take between the sacred tradition and the uh, worldly tradition, except nobody in his right mind would ever call the call to prayer and the cantillation of the Quran music. Uh, in fact, there, there was one Sufi in late 18th century Iran, Mushtaq Ali Shah, who played the Quran on an instrument. He was killed for that. The clerics uh, mobilized a mob to kill him as he was coming out of, uh, out of the mosque. So yes, absolutely, not silly at all. Very, very interesting. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, what about uh, Maharram um, Ashura yeah, same. singing morning yeah. that uses modern techniques of pop or? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely, and mix up, mixing, you know, the melange of this and that. And this isn't new. Correct. This isn't new. Uh, my father he said that in the 1930s, uh, when he uh, uh, went to Berlin, he went to the opera house and he heard a march, I think it was uh, either in Nabucco or in Aida, which he had heard in a uh, Muharram uh, uh, procession. So, uh, but the thing is that the Muharram rituals are not approved by the clerics. Uh, they are very, very uh, dubious, but the clerics simply don't have the power. I mean, there's a famous anecdote that is told that, uh, you know, the, the rituals include all sorts of things like self-flagellation, self-harming, uh, et cetera. So uh, it was Ayatollah Motahari who, uh, once addressed a, uh, a, a group of his followers and he said, am I your leader or not? Yes, you are. Uh, uh, I tell you, these practices are bad. You shouldn't uh, indulge in them. And somebody says, you are our leader 355 days of the year. For 10 days, you are not. Uh, these are the 10 days in which the rituals take place. Uh, but even then, the government constantly tries to rein in these things, and it doesn't succeed. That's the strength of folk religion as opposed to clerical religion. The, the little tradition, as anthropologists would say, as opposed to the grand tradition. So this, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, Hushan, fabulous, absolutely fabulous. I was just wondering, since you brought up uh, musical instruments and you just brought up um, you know, some grand traditions and small traditions, could you say something about the, the regulation of different ethnic traditions? Is it Absolutely. This is a very important point. Uh, one of the interesting things about traditional Iran that is that organized religion penetrated much less in the countryside. And that's why there is a uh, rich tradition of folk music in rural areas. Moreover, those regions of Iran, those peripheral regions that are inhabited by Sunnis, have a much richer musical tradition, folk tradition, because Sunnism is everything being equal, less hostile to music than Twelve or Shiism. So the Kurds, for instance, have a lot of music and dancing and so on, uh, as do the Baluchi and the Turkmens uh, and so on. And one of the things that happened after the revolution was precisely this, because uh, many c elements of sacred Kurdish music that uh, were part of uh, the practices of a minority religion in Iran known as the Yarasan. Uh, they are vaguely related to the Turkish Alevis. And uh, for them, music plays a very important role in their rituals. Many of the 
religiously informed musical practices were taken over by mainstream Persian classical musicians in order to sacralize the music and render it more acceptable in the eyes of the ruling clergy. And uh, the other thing about the Iranian revolution was that it was, like all populisms, a revolution of the countryside against the city. I mean, look at the who votes uh, for Trump and who votes uh, for the Democrats in America. Look at uh, the vote that Marine Le Pen gets in Paris. And so this gave greater, the Iranian revolution, one of the uh, results of it is greater self-confidence, cultural self-confidence in the peripheral areas. And so uh, there has been a huge development in folk music in Iran. There are festivals all over the country in which musicians from different parts um, play for each other, uh, CDs are being published, and so on. There has been a tremendous movement of, uh, of uh, recording and of developing even uh, provincial uh, musical traditions. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, the bar is open, <laughs> so help yourself.